UFC Vegas 90. This is the Way in Recap Show. Full card predictions and the betting breakdown. Looking forward to talking about each of the matchups on this card after seeing the fighters on the scales. So make sure you guys smash the like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Turn the post notifications on and make sure to share the video as well. And also note, full card Fight Companion live Saturday, which is tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Don't miss the Fight Companion. And let's get into the first fight of the night. We got Melissa Mullins versus Nora Cornell in a battle of girls who both missed weight. Not a good look at all here. Both of these girls coming in over the 135-pound uh, limit, or 136, rather, for non-title fights. Two-plus pounds. Looks horrible. Both girls are 1-0 and in the UFC. I'm not high on either one of them. I'll tell you that straight out the gate. I know Mullins right now is 6-0, and and I know Cornell has a good Muay Thai background. Low confidence Mullins pick. I think she probably wins a gritty decision. A lot of control against the cage. She's got a win over Alex Siva, which is okay. Like, Alex Siva's strong. She's got, you know, creative striking. And then Cornell on the opposite side, the Muay Thai background. But I didn't even think she won her debut. I think that she won a controversial decision against uh, Jocelyn Edwards. I'm going to say Mullins edges it by a tad. But yeah, betting side of this one would be a complete stay away, specifically because Mullins is a 3-1 to one favorite or more, which is just nonsensical to me. You can see Cornell, she actually looks in good shape for a girl that missed weight. And then on the opposite front, you can see Mullins, who uh, also came in looking okay. I'm not overly impressed by either of these girls' frames, which, you know, why would I be? They're not all that impressive. And then you look at the face-off. Looks like the battle of the misfits over here between these girls. And you can see Sean Shelby. Look at him. He looks fucking furious. He should look furious because he's got two girls in the opening bout that miss weight. There is a real pro possibility. It's a high probability, I'll say, that the loser of this fight could very easily be released from the promotion. Now, I wouldn't bet my house on them getting cut because the women's bantamweight division in 2024 is shite. And they need everybody that they can keep. But neither of these girls look like they're striving towards the damn world title. Regardless, I'm going to go Mullins on the cards. I do think she wins it. But like I said, man, not one that I'm very intrigued or interested in the betting side on. <sighs> Minus 340 for Melissa Mullins. Plus 280 for Cornell. That just doesn't really make sense. I think Melissa wins the fight. I think she brings a lot of pressure and cage control and lands takedowns. I don't know if I even want to touch the over because what if Melissa Dixon gets on top and subs her up? Uh, Melissa Mullins, rather. Dixon slash Mullins, sub plus 400. You know what? There's certain fights where I think your best option is probably just watching them. This one here from my side, watch. Yeah, probably Melissa Mullins is going to win on the scorecards. She probably controls against the cage. But at minus 340... Even in a parlay, why am I betting on low-level fighters? There's zero point to it. So personally, I'm not into the betting side. But I am picking Melissa Tonya Mullins by decision. Let's keep running. Next fight on the card, we have Dylan Budka versus Cesar Almeida. I'm going to pick Dylan Budka to win. I'm going to believe in wrestling. Budka's got a good amateur wrestling background. Cesar Almeida obviously was a high-tier kickboxer. Has fought Alex Pereira three times. Pretty impressive. He's 4-0 in MMA. He is 36, which is a little bit of a concern, right? A late transition to MMA. I know he's been training MMA for a while, but I do think Budka should land some takedowns, should garner some control time from top. I don't think that Cesar Almeida's adaptation to the wrestling uh, especially in the small cage at this point at 36 years of age are going to be enough to fight off a young Dylan Budka who's pretty solid. You look at Almeida's win on contender. I mean, he won as a dog and I picked him as a dog against Fernando. And you see Budka got a win against Chad Honeycomb and what wasn't a great fight. I think Budka edges him on the scorecards. He should. He should win. What are the people on? The people are on Almeida. Almeida is a very popular people's underdog this week. We'll check these two out on the scales. And something that immediately I noticed between both of these fighters when they face off, you'll see it. They're both in very quality shape. But they don't look 
large. Like they, these don't look like middleweights. If you told me, listen, look at these guys and guess the weight class, I think I'm guessing 170. They look like 170 pound fighters. So very interesting, right? They're not the tallest guys in the weight class. You can see Almeida's a little taller. I think Budka's wrestling is the biggest factor in this fight. So I am going to pick Budka. And you can see six foot and six one. Looks to me like they're both maybe six foot and five ten for Budka. Minus 150 for Budka to win, plus 130 for the side of Almeida with an over rounds at minus 170. I like Budka. I'm going to say that he gets it done. I do think he grinds out a decision. Budka by a decision is plus 185 probably on the scorecards, but money line would be your better shot at minus 150. I do think Budka's on his way to winning the fight. I don't love it though because Cesar Almeida has the knockout option potentially here, right? We do have KO wins for him and he's got a lot of kickboxing experience. The striking advantage is there. I just worry, especially in the small cage, how he deals with Budka's forward pressure and wrestling base. So I'm going to go with the wrestler. I'm going to go with the younger fighter. I'm going to go with Dylan Budka to get it done. Next fight on the card, we have Gene Matsumoto versus Dan Argetta. I'm riding with Gene Matsumoto to win. I think the dude's got a decent skill set here. He seems very well-rounded in striking and grappling. And Dan Argetta on the other side, he's physically strong. For sure, he can wrestle a bit. But he's not that impressive in his stand-up. He's more known for toughness than anything else. And uh, being tough in the fight game ultimately means you get touched up a bit. It means you're getting beat. And I think Matsumoto is a much more sophisticated skill set on the opposite front. Now, he's young at 24, right? When you get guys off contender series at 24, this is a legit competition test for him. But I think Matsumoto can win. I think Matsumoto on the judges' scorecards. I do believe it. Could he get a finish? Maybe. But, you know, Matsumoto money line would be better because we don't know for sure with the prospect. How good is Dan Argetta going to be on his back? What happens if Argetta gets his back taken? Is Dan going to get subbed up? Maybe. Matsumoto also looks in tremendous shape. And then Argetta looks pretty jacked as well. He looks freaky, though. He looks like a damn bald caveman. Holy shit, he looks weird here. He looks more like a great ape than a damn human being. Holy fuck. Then there's the face-off between the two. Matsumoto at 24. I think he's ready to go. I believe in the 24-year-old. The skills are very good. And I got to pick skill over toughness. Matsumoto's minus 170. He should win this thing at minus 170. Argetta plus 145. Let's look at something. Gene Matsumoto, method of victory for him normally, right? He's got three knockouts, five subs, and six decisions. So ultimately, he's ready to go long, but he's proven that he can finish some fights. We know Dan Argetta on the opposite front hasn't been finished before. Does have a content, excuse me, an ultimate fighter loss to Tercios, which didn't age well. So, you know, Gene Matsumoto's confidence even skyrockets there. What's Matsumoto? Sub for Matsumoto plus 650. The value is on the sub side. Matsumoto inside distance is plus 315. But officially, I do think we're getting a decision for Matsumoto, which is plus 125. But that's no fun as far as prop betting goes. Uh, the submission at plus 650 is interesting. Because what if Argetta puts himself in a bad spot? What if he gets his back taken? Ultimately, Gene Matsumoto down the line, minus 170. That is the official pick. And I feel pretty certain that it's going to end up coming through. Let's keep running up. Next fight. Next fight on the card. We got short notice replacement, Pedro Falco versus Victor Hugo. I'm going to pick Victor Hugo. I'm not going to take a short notice replacement in Falco. But I will say, Falco's got a good bullying grappling style. Uh, he fought against Anderson Dos Santos recently in a boxing match and went to a draw. Granted, you know, both those guys are MMA fighters. They're not known for his hands. It's not like he's going out there and, you know, boxing with Tank Davis. He's fighting another MMA fighter slash ex-UFC fighter in Anderson Dos Santos. I feel like Victor Hugo can win, but it's going to be a strong test. Falco's tricky to say, man. We've seen him fight at lower levels and get good control time. He's a good pressure grappler, real good pressure grappler. But Victor Hugo has very good jiu-jitsu. I think it's going to be close. I'm going to say Hugo wins it, though. Now, when Falco stepped in on short notice, first thing I got to say, mad respect, mad respect to him stepping in on short notice because 
very easily. You know, most guys, they fuck that. And then they'll come in overweight if it's short notice. No, he came in on weight, on point at 135 pounds. He is a winner on the contender series, though he wasn't signed. You can look back. It was against James Barnes, and he beat him up. He controlled the whole fight with grappling. He's got good grappling. And he fought him by. His striking's okay. Victor Hugo's more impressive with his jiu-jitsu, though. Tricky, tricky, tricky. I think Hugo wins a competitive decision. Falco is going to be an interesting player in the UFC bantamweight division towards the back end, uh, you know, because the grappling skill set looks really strong. This is a weird one because I think Victor Hugo may have difficulty with Pedro Falco's style, and I don't love Victor Hugo's chance striking. I'm going to go Hugo. Not the most confident call on Hugo. Now, if we look at them on the scales, first thing I'm going to say, just you got to give Falco mad respect for making weight for this fight here. You can see the Calvillo and uh, Pierre Rodriguez canceled bout there. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Victor Hugo looks okay. Decent mustache. Definitely sucked in. Pedro Falco looks like a bad motherfucker with that stash. He looks like... Uh, Straight out of fucking Tijuana with that mustache. The dude looks like he's in the cartel. Face tattoo as well. Bad looking dude. Looks like a motherfucking savage. There's the face off. I got to respect Falco for looking this shredded on short notice. You know the dude trains his ass off. I'm going to go with Hugo to win. Falco, it's just, it's unknown where he's at right now in 2024. And I can't pick an unknown I'd be going out on a whim just trying to pick an underdog. Not going to do it. I'm going to go with Victor Hugo, who I think is pretty good. Victor Hugo is minus 130, the favorite. Falco is plus 110, the underdog. Extremely close line between these two. Victor Hugo, I do believe, pulls it off. You betting on props in this one, good luck to you, okay? Because, you know, the submission threat is there for both guys, really. Over one and a half is minus 185. I feel like we're going over one and a half. What is Falco's most common method of victory? You can see here. Five submissions, six KOs with five decisions. And you have a good variety with Hugo on the other side too, man. It's just Hugo's coming off that contender series win. Eight knockouts, nine subs, seven decisions. Very interesting fight. I'm going to go with Hugo to pull it off. And I think we'll go three hard rounds. Now, next fight. I will mention is the fizzled bout between Cynthia Calvillo and Pierre Rodriguez. Calvillo miss weight. She can't make weight. She's probably getting cut from the UFC. Five fight losing streak. You miss weight. Your fight gets canceled. She's probably getting her walking papers. Disappointed we don't see that fight. I was thinking underdog Calvillo was going to be the winner. I picked her as a dog. Fight is off. That is the game. Let's keep running up. Let's get to our next fight on the card. Good women's battle between Norma Dumont and Jermaine Durandame. I've been riding with Jermaine Durandame all week, but I've said to you guys, I want to see her on the scales. I want to look at the physicality. She did have a baby recently, and we'll pull up the scales right now, and we'll check her out. I don't think she looked bad at all. Now, on the opposite front, Norma Dumont cutting from 145 now to 35. Durandame looked pretty good. She looks like a mother, though, but she looked pretty good. And then... Dumont, holy shit, she looks in the best shape I've ever seen her. She looks lean. That's interesting. And then there's the face-off. Cut up abs right there for Dumont. If Durandame is 80% of what she once was, she is a tricky stylistic matchup for Norma Dumont. The concern is if she's not. I'm going to say she is. I'm going to pick Jermaine Durandame. I've been riding with her all week, and she looked good on the scale. Nothing is telling me jump off this pick because of how she looked on the scale. And pick flipping, notoriously for me, leads me to losses. I'm going to stick with the underdog. I'm going to stick with Durandame. And I do think she can beat Norma Dumont in what's going to be an upset. Looking at the odds for the fight, Dumont is minus 116. Durandame minus 104. Do you see this? The line is completely shifted. Everybody's on Durandame. Why? Because they were waiting for the weigh-ins to see if she looked good, and she absolutely did. She's going to win as an underdog. Straight down the line bet is your best bet. Durandame inside distance is plus 375. She is a pretty solid finisher. Durandame has knockout capabilities, and she definitely has a submission threat. Uh, Dumont was knocked out against Megan Anderson, who's a tall striker. And then she also lost a decision to Macy Chiasson. 
who's tall with also good pressure. The frame of the Randame seems to be a kryptonite to Norma Dumont, and I'm going to pick Jermaine the Randame, the Iron Lady, to pull this one out. We're riding with her still to get it done, even at 39, and I think right away she becomes a title contender with a W over a very game Norma Dumont. Now, one of the best women's featherweights in the UFC, now cutting down to 135. Next fight on the card featured prelim. We got Court McGee versus Alex Morono. I love this fight. I'm picking Alex Morono as the lock. I think that he wins. I see him rocking Court McGee on the feet. Morono's got a big speed advantage. He moves very well. McGee's not going to be able to bully Alex Morono in grappling positions. And when you're caught up on the feet with Alex Morono, especially a Court McGee who's lost back-to-back -back fights by a knockout, I think he's in big trouble. You look at Morono's recent losses. Buckley, who just beat up Luke A and honestly had his breakout performance. Win against Tim Means by submission. That was impressive. Lost to Ponzinibbio in a fight that he was controlling until he got rocked in the final round. Matt Semmelsberger win. Mickey Gall win. You look on the other front. Knockout loss to Matt Brown. Knockout loss to Wells. Does have Ws over Brahima and Claudio Silva, which are okay wins. A loss there now way back to, you know, the... Old man Carlos Condit rests to, uh, I guess not rest in peace, but peace out to the legend. Carlos Condit was a savage in his prime. I think Morono outstrikes him. I think Morono's live to knock him out. I'm going to pick Morono by KO officially, but uh, the lock would be the money line, of course. Let's check these two out. There is Alex Morono, never a menacing physique, but in shape for three rounds. Court McGee actually looks pretty ripped up, but he looks aged and weathered. You can see it in his face. He's had some wars, man. There's the face-off between the two. Ah, I think Court McGee's chin is gone. I think Morono's going to starch him. Brutal knockout incoming. And uh, Alex Morono gets back on track with a win. He beats a Court McGee. Minus 290, Morono the favorite. McGee plus 245. And under 2.5 is plus 100 with a Morono by knockout. Officially sitting at plus 175. I think Morono is a lock parlay piece. He's a big money favorite for sure. He's a chalky locky, but he's still going to hit. And we're going to hit. Morono, for the win, I'm calling knockout. Lock this week. Extremely high confidence pick. And I do think it's something you can parlay up for certain. Next fight on the card. Let's jump to our main card opener. If you guys haven't yet, make sure you smash the likes. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. When you look at this fight, you got a potential fight of the night. Trevor Peak, Charlie Campbell. I'm going with Charlie Campbell to win. Charlie Campbell is the better technical striker. Trevor Peak is a swanging and banging country boy brawler, and he definitely rips super hard shots and has some good physical strength to him. He's a strong country boy. But Charlie Campbell is going to be lighting him up with straight shots. I think Campbell ends up rocking Trevor Peak. And unless Trevor Peak has that titanium jaw that's unbreakable, well, granted, it's a wide jaw, maybe it is. I think Campbell's very live to win by knockout in this fight. I've been confident in Campbell to KO him all week. Looking at the scales between these two. Let's check them out. Let's check them out. There is Campbell, who looks in great shape. There is Peak, who also looks in very good shape. And then there's the face-off. You can see a bit of the height edge for Charlie Campbell. He's got the, uh, the under-eye stripe there, looking like he's a fucking uh, left tackle in the NFL. I think Trevor Peak comes to bang, but I think he gets himself in trouble doing so. I think that Charlie Campbell is going to find that kill switch. I think Campbell's knocking him out. He's just significantly better technically. And Peak, he didn't knock out his last opponent in Yaya, who I didn't think was that good. Peak is a plus 142 underdog. Obviously, he's a people's pick as a dog. They love him as a dog. Then on the opposite side, Campbell's a minus 162 favorite. I got to go with the favorite. I got to go Campbell. I think KO. Campbell by knockout sits at plus 155. I do think he can be the first guy to sleep Trevor Peak. I'm going Charlie Campbell to win. I'm going ginger power. I like the reach advantage too. Peak's very open to get hit with straight shots. And trust me, Charlie Campbell's going to exploit that weakness. Campbell for the knockout. Next fight on the card, we got Lukas Dreschke versus Walter Walker. <sighs> I've been picking Volter Walker all week. I think he's going to win. He's a wild card. I mean, he's the brother of Johnny Walker, which is pretty badass. But he's a wild card, though, for sure. Because we don't know how he's going to look when the fight gets later. I know he's gone five rounds or four rounds with Alex Nicholson. He stopped him late. 
he's a menacing force at you know six foot six with an 81 inch reach and weighing every bit at 264. He's got a 28 pound weight advantage, and I gotta assume that helps him with takedowns. Let's check him out on the scales. I'll be honest, something I noticed about Walter Walker, he looked more jacked outside of the UFC. Let's look at Dreschke. Dreschke was looking shredded on Instagram. In reality, he's got the same bod. He's the same guy. Walker looks a little fatter than I anticipated with less muscle mass than I anticipated. Maybe we got uh, you know, a little tricked with lighting or whatnot, or maybe he just had a good pump in some recent fights. But I expect him to look more jacked. Regardless, though, I do think Walter Walker gets this fight to the floor where he's going to be most comfortable, and I think he's dominant from there. Now, Walker is a little bit of a wild card striking. He's the brother of Johnny Walker, of course. He's crazy on the feet. You put yourself in dangerous spots with that. And Dreschke, he's not like he hasn't knocked people out. Now, inside of the UFC, Dreschke's, you know, 0-3, but he probably should have won his debut against Boudet. He got robbed. Plus 205 for Dreschke, minus 240 for Walter Walker. I'm going to say Walker wins. You betting on the over, you're a wild man. Minus 180 with these big boys? Shit. Walker by KO is plus 115. I'm kind of seeing ground and pound as a big probability or possibility here. I'm going to go with Walter Walker to win. I'm going to believe in Johnny Walker's brother, as pretty much everybody is. 93% of the people picking him on topology. I want to get him here. 26. I don't know how this dude's 26. He looks 35. Walter Walker for the W. I think he gets a finish as well. I'm going to say KO, TKO, ground and pound, and uh, he gets an impressive UFC debut. Fun prospect with a crazy frame, and it's badass that Johnny Walker's his brother. Next fight, Ignacio Bajomandez versus Christos Yagos. I'm picking Bajomandez with confidence. He's got to dust Yagos. I think he wins by sub probably, similar to what we saw with Zell Huber. Similar frame for Bajomandez too as Zell Huber. I got to take a sip of water real quick, guys. To me, I see Yagos as a tough veteran, but past his best days versus somebody at 26 and Ignacio Bajomandez who's going to just consistently improve. Let's check these guys out on the scales. Now, Bajo Mendez cuts a lot of weight. He looked even more sucked in if you watch the weigh-in video. What I'm thinking with Bajo Mendez is eventually he's going to have to move up to 170. He's only making this weight at 55, or rather 56 right now. I don't even know if he can make 55, 56, because he's, you know, 26. At 29, I think he's going to be up. And then you can see Yagos. Yagos looks jacked, but... He looks homeless here. He looks homeless. He looks like a jacked homeless dude. He's doing uh, pull-ups on the monkey bars at the park or some shit. <laughs> Listen, I got to go with the side of the prospect. I got to go Bajo Mendez. He's a lot taller, a lot longer, and a lot more primed. Expect improvement from Bajo Mendez. And at this point with Yagos, he could just be holding on to whatever's left of his skill set. Now, looking at the odds, Bajo Mendez minus 320, doesn't matter. Confident call. Plus 280 for Yagos on the opposite front. Over is minus 175. And Yagos by submission. What is that? Or excuse me, Yagos by sub. Bajo Mendes by sub. Plus 300. I do think Bajo Mendes is live for a sub. I'm going to pick Bajo Mendes to win. I think he is live for a sub. I think KO or sub. I think inside distance Bajo Mendes. Granted, it's a chalky line. Minus 150 for inside distance. We're going Bajo Mendes as the official pick. In this fight right here, I think he pulls it off over Christos Yagos. Next fight on the card, featured bout of the night. We got Morgan Charrier versus Shepe Mariscal. I'm going to go with Shepe Mariscal as a scrappy underdog to win. I think he's going to bring some heat. I think he's going to mix it up wildly. I think he'll bring pressure. He'll land some takedowns. He'll win a competitive fight. I do. I believe that. Sharia is going to be backed up. If Sharia is left at the striking from distance range, he's going to be able to flow and shine. But when you press him backwards, when you make him uncomfortable, that's a Chepe Mariscal fight. And that is the style in which Morgan Sharia is going to take an L with. So we're going with Chepe Mariscal to get a W over Morgan Sharia. Now looking at the scales between these savages. Let's check them out. There is Shepe Mariscal on the scale with the shades looking like a badass. Then there is Morgan Charrier on the opposite side looking in very good shape. 
And there's a face-off, man. Both guys are ready to go. Shari has lost nine fights. I know he's considered a prospect, but he's very experienced. This is his 30th pro fight. I think Chepe Mariscal outworks him for three rounds and wins a gritty decision. Minus 101, plus 100 for Mariscal, minus 120 for Charrier, and over is minus 200. Mariscal by decision is plus 200. I do think Chepe wins as an ever so slight underdog. I'm picking Chepe still here. I think he does pull it off. I got Chepe Mariscal to win as a dog in a bit of a scrap, close battle. He's going to beat Morgan Charrier and move to 3 0 in the UFC. Next fight on the card, co-main event of the evening. We got Alexander Hernandez versus Damon Jackson. You know, Alexander Hernandez missed weight by four fucking pounds. He is not a UFC featherweight. He's not. He shouldn't be fighting that featherweight. He decided not to cut that extra weight. On the opposite side, it looked like Damon Jackson left his soul on the damn scales. Holy shit. Look at Damon Jackson. He looks like a zombie. Listen, if he shows up to the Walking Dead tryouts like that, they'll have him as the main zombie. Holy shit. And then Hernandez, who missed weight, I mean, he still looks like he's got a little fullness. He could have cut another four. I think he could have cut another four. He chose to be sneaky. He chose to have an advantage. And Hernandez, good gamesmanship, he's going to win this fight. Hernandez is going to win. I think he probably wins a decision. Damon Jackson's got a good chin. He's an OG. He's a vet. Both guys vets at this point. I got to lean the favor of Alexander Hernandez or has MMA junkie has it. Alexander. <laughs> That's funny as fuck. I'm on Hernandez who missed weight. I'm still going to pick him. It's not like a weight miss where he looked dead on the scales. Jackson looked way worse at weigh-ins and he made weight. Minus 200 Hernandez plus 170 for Damon Jackson. Over rounds is plus 130, but I really could see this thing going over rounds. Hernandez by a decision is plus 325. I'm going to pick Alexander Hernandez to win. I think he does pull it off. We're going Alexander Hernandez over Damon Jackson. I think he can win. I think he's a little faster on the feet. I think he's going to be physically stronger, technically superior. And I think he's getting his hand raised over Damon Jackson. We're going Hernandez for the W in this fight. Next fight on the card, our main event of the evening, if you guys haven't yet. Make sure you smash the likes. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. We got Brendan Allen versus Chris Curtis too. We got the rematch between these two savages. You know, I'm picking the side of Chris Curtis as an underdog. And I knew he was going to look good on the scales. I don't doubt it. And the scales weren't a major concern for me. Chris Curtis has the nuclear option. He has the power advantage. He's the better boxer of the two. Brendan Allen on the opposite side. We got to respect the jiu-jitsu game. We got to respect him on the floor and the improved stand-up. The issue lies upon this. Has he proven to be able to take down and control a guy with the defense of Chris Curtis? I personally feel like, mm, no. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think Chris Curtis is going to catch Brendan Allen in a striking match. And I think Chris Curtis is going to deliver some heavy shots to the body and head. Looking at the scales between these two, there is Chris Curtis looking jacked, shredded up. There is Brendan Allen looking in pretty good shape. Then there's the face-off. There it is. I think the action man's knocking him out again. I'm going Chris Curtis for the W. I think he can win. I think Chris Curtis can dice him up with shots. I think he can rock him. I think he can put him down. I think he can put his lights out. Southpaw stance too. I don't think Allen's successful on takedowns here. Chris Curtis has a 92% takedown defense rate. He's not easy to get down. And I think he'll be hard to keep down. Brendan Allen's a minus 220 favorite. Chris Curtis a plus 185 dog. I'm going with the main event on the dog. Looking at win for Curtis by knockout, plus 300. Now, if you're picking Allen, plus 275 for decision, only plus 125 for submission. It's going to be hard to sub up Chris Curtis, man. Who's bullying him on the floor in the UFC? Name somebody. It hasn't happened yet. He's fought off a shitload of takedown. And his striking is clearly better than Allen. We've seen this fight before, and Curtis caught him clean. Now it's five rounds to do so. I know Curtis maybe didn't look great against Burial, 
but you can't shame him for a no contest with Imavov, a loss where he was headbutted against Gastelum. He does have a knockout win over Buckley, and then a loss to Jack Hermanson, who's extremely calculated, technical, good at picking shots, can win three-round decisions and stay away from you. Brendan Allen's got a nice five-fight win streak. I thought he could have lost to Malcolm. He beat Jocko, who got cut. Muniz, who's just a grappler. Bruno Silva, who just lost to Chris. I know the eye pokes, fair, but he didn't look good against Weidman. Then he beat Paul Craig, whose majority of his game built upon grappling and known for slow striking. I think Chris Curtis is on his way to winning by KO. I think this is just a tough, stylistic matchup for Brendan Allen time and time again. So in the main event of UFC Vegas 90, I'm going with the side of Chris Curtis. And you may be thinking, wait, are we done? Absolutely not. We're not done yet. It's not the end of the show. You know what we got to talk about? Some damn parlays to play for this card. So, I like straight money underdog attacks first and foremost over, you know, trying to proper things up or parlay things up. What I want is giving you confidence. Bajo Mendes, Morono. Minus 126 range. I think these two are heavy hitters that come through. Now, from there, if you want to steam things up, you believe in a prospect, Matsumoto should win at plus 193. You want to add some dynamite heat to that? You want to go underdog in the main event? Chris Curtis at plus 719. Maybe you like Jermaine D. Rondeme as a slight dog. Plus 1,600 now. Maybe you don't want Curtis. Maybe you don't want Matsumoto. You're like, yo, keep me away from the Young Bucks. Plus 280 for this one. I do believe it hits. I don't hate the idea, though, of adding somebody like a Curtis. Adding a Matsumoto. And I also think this Mariscal fight could end up going over rounds. Plus 2,464 for this craziness. Not telling you to go bet the house on this. Be intelligent. Charlie Campbell... Also a parlay piece you could add in. I know a lot of you guys like Trevor Peak as an underdog, but he's going to get exposed by a better technical fighter. Little alternate, Bajo Mendes, Campbell, plus 110. You add in Morono, now you got plus 188. You throw underdog Chris Curtis at the top, you got plus 706. And then you throw in Matsumoto early in the night, plus 12. And then we got what? Durandame, plus 2700. Feeling good about some of these calls, man. Confident picks... They're on the table. Like, betting Budka's a risk, right? Because he's debuting. And Almeida, even though he's known for just the kickboxing and Budka's got the wrestling, it's a, a wild factor for a 24-year-old. Volta Walker probably wins against Lucas Dreschke, but he hasn't fought anybody high level, specifically not UFC level. Hernandez does probably win at minus 195, even though he missed weight. He's just, it's Hernandez, eh, just a look. But this is, you know, degeneracy. I like the two-fighter parlay that I dropped. If you want to throw, maybe you're throwing over rounds. Maybe you like the over here with Chepe. I do think this is a little riskier of an over, but I do think it happens. Maybe you like Morono. Let's put Morono in the lineup, plus 102. Maybe you like Bajo Mendes, plus 165. I like the calls. I like where, where it's all at. That's UFC Vegas 90. Those are the parlays. Be intelligent. These Apex cards are where a fuckload of people are getting burned. At Atlantic City, it was Money Town with the underdogs. Apex... World War fucking three. Bet intelligently. Do your own research if you're looking to throw down. I hope you guys enjoyed the breakdown. Let me know in the comments what you thought and throw me some of your favorite picks and bets on the card. I appreciate everybody who tunes in. We're about to hit 30,000 subscribers. So make sure you all sub it up. Make sure you guys smash the likes. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you all for watching. And I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.